When I was nine, my family took a trip to Disneyland. It was the first time that either uh, my little sister or I had ever flown on a plane. In fact, aside from a family trip to Fargo for my aunt's wedding, it was only the second time either of us had been outside the state of Montana. We went in the off-season, which was awesome because there were almost no lines. All the locals were bundled up against the cold, and here we are in our shorts and our t-shirts enjoying this beautiful weather. And I remember, I think most of all, being excited about the rides. I'd never been to a theme park before, because there aren't any in Montana. And I always wanted to ride roller coasters. So when we got to Disneyland, I rode every one I could, but my favorite was Splash Mountain. I went on Splash Mountain three times. I went once with my dad and twice with my mom. I would have loved to have gone with both of them at the same time, but I couldn't. I couldn't because my little sister, who was six at the time, was afraid of the dark. And there was about a half a minute where I went through a dark tunnel, and so she refused to get on. Now, that wasn't anything new. This, there were several rides on that trip she wouldn't do because of the dark. She wouldn't ride space tours, even though it was no worse than a darkened theater. Of course, she didn't sit through the IMAX movie we tried to do either. One of my parents had to wait outside with her for that, too. Now, I, for one, was particularly annoyed. This was supposed to be a family trip, right? But thanks to my fraidy cat little sister, it seemed like half of us were always in a lobby or a foyer somewhere while the other half were having fun. So how do you make a six-year-old ride Splash Mountain? The answer is you don't. I tried encouraging her. I tried bribing her. I even tried lying to her and telling her that it wasn't dark at all, it was fine, but she saw right through me. I can't help but think about this story today as we listen to the conclusion of John's account of the feeding of the 5,000. After the people who ate their fill of the loaves came looking for more, Jesus offers them something better, something they are not prepared to take. In fact, by the end of the story, even the committed followers and students of Jesus are turning away from him and deserting him. This teaching is hard, they complain. Who can accept it? Two weeks ago, Jesus said, No one can come to me unless drawn by the Father who sent me. One of the questions implicit in this story, then, is why these people are leaving if they've been drawn by the Father. Or why hasn't God drawn these people in? Wouldn't it make more sense for God just to make us all listen and obey what God, if that's what God wants? Why doesn't God just make us do what God wants us to do? Or to put it another way, how do you get a six-year-old on a roller coaster? Even if you physically pick her up and strap her in, you cannot make her have a good time, and that defeats the entire purpose of the ride. This is the conundrum. God created us to have life and to have it abundantly. God created us in God's own image so that we might share in God's eternal life by loving as God loves by abiding as God abides, by participating in God's work of creating and redeeming creation. And yet we choose not to. We consistently choose to turn away, to pay lip service to God as creator, but ultimately to place our trust in those things we think will serve us better. We have much more faith in guns and armies and prisons than we do in God. And so here's Jesus offering us the bread of life, and we turn away instead to find other loaves to fill us, because that's what we're used to. As we've read through this story in these past weeks, I've been particularly interested in what this story has to say to us as the church and to us as a congregation in this time. We've only just begun worshiping in person again, And the temptation is strong to want to go back to normal. But if we're being honest with ourselves, normal wasn't serving us that well to begin with, was it? Even before the pandemic hit. One of the blessings we've been given in this is that now that we are back, we have to. In fact, 
Maybe I should say we get to reconsider everything that we do, all of the way we do ministry, and think about whether it's worth doing or doing in the same way. And so I find myself reconsidering how we function as congregations, as this congregation. For years now, I've been listening to the anxiety of church people everywhere as we frantically try to figure out how to get people to join our congregation, how to get that six-year-old on the roller coaster. I can identify with the disappointment and the frustration that we feel that those people out there don't want to ride the rides with us because that's how I felt at Disneyland. But now that I'm an adult and I've had some time to think about that trip and what happened and what it meant, I've come to wonder why we're letting other people's decisions stress us out. Let me ask you this. Why do you think anybody should join this congregation? Why do you think anybody should become a Christian or go to church? Is it because you think they would enjoy it? Because it's important and meaningful to you and you think that it will be for them if they just give it a try? That's exactly how I felt on Splash Mountain. I love that ride. I just knew my sister would love it if she'd get over herself for a moment and come along. The fact that she didn't made me angry. I felt like she was robbing me of something by not going, like she was rejecting something that I had to offer. That made me mad. Sometimes what begins as a genuine desire to share something beautiful and meaningful as one beggar to tell another where to find bread becomes something personal. We offer this thing that means so much to us, that's so precious to us, that's such a piece of ourselves, and if it's rejected, it feels like a rejection of ourselves. We don't like being made to feel vulnerable like that. And we are vulnerable. As a congregation, as an institution, we rely on new people coming in and sustaining this budget that sustains us. But then we have to ask, do we want new people to come in because we think it will be good for them or because it will be good for us? All of a sudden, inviting someone to church becomes about supporting our church habit perpetuating an institution so it will be here for us. How quickly that search for the bread of life can become a fight over barley loaves. When it seems like something is scarce, something like money for a budget or like esteem or acceptance in the eyes of others, we start looking to the idols of the world to protect us. Those things that we're used to, that we know how they work, those things we feel we can manipulate. But remember the story we're telling, right? Didn't this story start with Jesus even multiplying those barley loaves beyond our wildest imaginings? The people in the story wanted a repeat of the manna miracle. They wanted bread from heaven, enough to keep them alive forever. And so Jesus says to them, we've got the right idea, but you're looking in the wrong place. I am the bread of life, he says. We know this. We've heard it over and over and over, but even we, even Jesus' disciples, sometimes miss the forest for the trees. Or in this case, miss the bread of life for all this talk about flesh and blood. I think it's reasonable to assume in this story that Peter is just as disgusted and confused as any of the other disciples who turned away. But unlike them, Peter knows that none of these other things that he might look for can give him life. And so he says, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. Nobody else has them. You have them. As confused and as disgusted as he might be, he decides to stick it out and hope for the best. And that's what I'm getting at. If it's Jesus who has the words of eternal life, why do we get so hung up on things like institutions and budgets and attendance numbers and programs? Why are we so concerned about making those things continue? Why do we keep trying to force the six-year-old onto the roller coaster? 
It's the Spirit that gives life, Jesus says. The flesh is useless. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. So I wonder if we're going about this all the wrong way. Now, you might think from the beginning of my story that my sister had a terrible time at Disneyland, that she spent all of her time in foyers and lobbies. But that's not true. She had a great time. She made us ride stupid rides like the teacups, but we all had fun doing it together. And you know what? Part of what made me angriest in that time was the thought that she was making my parents miss out of the fun at being at Disneyland. But of course, what I know now is that they didn't come there to ride the rides and see the attractions. Yeah, I'm sure they were bummed to miss out on a few of those things, but the reason they came there was so that their children could have fun, so that we could have this experience as a family. And we did. Even sitting in a lobby, that's what they were doing. They were spending time with her, spending time with us, which is all they wanted to do. My sister wasn't ruining my experience. I was ruining my own experience, right? I was the one who was so upset that things weren't the way I thought they should be, and I was the one that was having a bad time. But when I got out of my own way, when I instead chose simply to abide with her and with my family, we all had fun. It may not have been Splash Mountain, but it was good. And even though we didn't all do everything together, we were still there together. And that's what I remember. And that's what I treasure. So maybe that's one thing we can take away from this story. Maybe if we're really in this to help everyone have a good time, to invite everyone to partake of the bread of life, it's not a question of how to force a six-year-old onto a roller coaster but rather a question of what rides can we all ride together that aren't in the dark so we can share this experience with one another. Even though she didn't do Splash Mountain, we kept inviting and asking my sister to, do, to take this ride or that one. And oddly enough, she ended up loving the Matterhorn, which in my opinion was a lot darker and more intense than Splash Mountain. I tried explaining this to her, but she still wouldn't go on Splash Mountain with me. But that's what Jesus does. And it's, I think, what Jesus invites us to do, to keep making the invitations, to keep listening, to keep abiding, to keep calling and drawing and and being with. My sister will tell you today that she's, frankly, a little embarrassed about how scared she was at the time, but, I mean, she was six, what do you expect? And that she wishes she had taken better advantage of our time in Disneyland. And for that reason, I'm glad that we kept inviting her to try new things because it meant that she didn't actually spend all of her time in lobbies. And I think she's glad too. And so I wonder then if that's not something else that we can take from this story, that it's okay to keep inviting as long as we remember why we're doing it. It's okay to keep inviting as long as we also keep listening and keep abiding. Because that's what I hear Jesus say in this, that it's in the abiding that we find eternal life.